10 years is about right. 10 years ago, you could put a billion dollars to work in Bitcoin and there was enough depth and liquidity. So over that 10 year period, I haven't done the exact math, but my guess is that multiplier is 20s, somewhere like that. And it's, and it's declining, right? Because it's the law of large numbers. When, when you're starting with a small amount, a little bit of money pops the value. The inefficiency of the market, the gaps between bid and ask and the global marketplace, all of that was, was challenging. Today, the market's much, much bigger and the gaps are smaller and there's a lot of arbitrageurs and there's a lot of professional money. So my guess is that number's coming down, but it's still a meaningful number. And that's my point of if 300, so we've had 15-ish billion come in in the last three months into yep. the ETF. It's a big number. And we went from kind of 47,000 before to 70,000, you know, so that's, 40% increase on a, you know, 800 billion. So, you know, it's about 400 billion. So 400 divided by 15, that's a big multiplier. Ten years ago, putting a billion dollars into Bitcoin was a feasible strategy due to the depth and liquidity available at the time. Over the decade, we've seen a significant growth shifting from a volatile market with large bid-ask spreads to a more stabilized global market filled with professional money and arbitrageurs. This evolution has naturally decreased the dramatic multiplier effects early investors once enjoyed. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like the video to stay updated on all things crypto. Let's get into it. So if, if we get 300 billion, let's say it's down at 20, that's 6 trillion of value. And if we hit six trillion of value, now we're at that gold equivalence number and now we're in the hundreds of thousands. So maybe I am too bearish. Maybe. I, I want to go through a couple of rapid fire questions and I like your long answers, but we'll see how we um, right. go there. CBDCs, are they good or bad? And how can people protect themselves from CBDCs? Pure evil. Pure evil. They're, they're the worst thing maybe in the history of mankind that I can think of. I mean, they're probably worse things, but pure evil. And um, how do you avoid it? You got to have money outside the system, right? The, the idea that we're going to have systems that determine where we can travel, when we can travel, if we can travel, where we can spend our money, if we can spend our money. I use a simple example. You got a CBDC. You get paid, you worked hard all week, you get paid on Friday, you have a couple cocktails, you drunk text about the president and you wake up and your money's worth 75 cents on the dollar. That's bullshit. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, that could never happen. Sure it could. How about this? How about Target pays the government a little something, something and your money doesn't work at Walmart anymore? Oh, that could never, well, that, that could happen too. Or yeah. how about, you know, you went to a protest and facial recognition saw you and they freeze your bank account. As Mark Yusko pointed out, the introduction of significant capital, such as $15 billion into ETFs over just three months, can dramatically shift market prices, as seen with the Bitcoin price surge from $47,000 to $70,000. Reflecting on Yusko's comments on reaching a market valuation similar to gold, the scale of Bitcoin's potential becomes clear. If the crypto market were to absorb $300 billion, it could theoretically reach a $6 trillion valuation. This projection sets a staggering precedent for Bitcoin's equivalence to traditional safe havens like gold. Moreover, Yusko's critical stance on CBDCs highlights the significant privacy and autonomy concerns they might introduce, contrasting sharply with the decentralized nature of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Look, every country, literally every country, has gotten comfortable with the idea of gold being the base layer for their currency. Okay, that's, that's the only money. And then they issue currency on top of that backed by debt. And, you know, JP Morgan said it, right? Gold is the only money in the world. Everything else is just credit. And so central banks around the world have been accumulating gold, China in particular, just buying, you know, the crud out of it. And so they get that. I believe there are a couple, I think Estonia has been rumored and, and there's probably one or two others. Uh, El Salvador certainly has that have bought a little bit and, and it's been a little bit, 
But at some point, to your point, someone's going to figure out that gold is being disrupted by Bitcoin. And therefore, we collectively as central banks need it to be at the base layer of our currency. It's, I think it'll happen the same way the renminbi did. Everybody's like, I don't want the renminbi. I don't want the renminbi. Oh, damn. Saudi and China are trading in renminbi and Russia and China are trading in renminbi. Okay, fine. I'll put some in the SDR. I'll put, no, I'm going to put a lot. I'll put a little. And once you're a, a reserve currency, ultimately, then you can, not necessarily, you can be the world reserve currency. And so I think the question for me is how much and how quickly, because the nation states are not going away soon. They might yep. go away, right? I can, I can envision a world, not in my lifetime, maybe in my granddaughter's lifetime, maybe, where we live in a borderless, nation stateless metaverse, not necessarily in goggles, but, but just where the, the yep. idea of a nation state doesn't, isn't as necessary because if you go back through history, the threat of violence is what kept nation states in power, the, the superpower. Well, yep. China figured out a while ago that the next big war is not going to be fought with ships. It's going to be fought with chips. And so everything they're doing in terms of graduating, you know, three and a half million engineers in STEM, trying to bring chip manufacturing into China to re reduce their reliance on Taiwan, everything's you know, banning Bitcoin quietly and wanting to have a, a central bank digital currency. All of it is about digital superiority. Yeah. And other nations, I think, will flow there. The question is whether the CBDCs, that will all be independent, will win, or whether we'll have that aha moment where global citizens say, you know what, I can opt out and I can live in El Salvador on a Bitcoin standard. I can live in Costa Rica on a Bitcoin standard. I can live in Madeira on a Bitcoin standard. And it doesn't take a lot for eventually a movement to, to, to work. And so yeah. that's a hopeful answer because, you know, the alternative of dystopian nightmare and stopped at the border and cavity searches. I don't like that. And <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, <laughs> Bitcoin and blockchain busts the financial monopoly 838 years since the Medici's created it. It busted it wide open. And that financial freedom as we liberate the trust industry, right? The trust industry, banks, brokerages, insurance companies, etc., extract seven trillion. There's that T word again. Seven trillion dollars from us every year. That's six to eight percent of global GDP. That goes away when we swap trust for truth. Bitcoin yeah. is truth. Blockchain technology is the truth net. Yeah. And it sure as we're sitting here, and I've been talking about this for a long time. It all started with the mainframe computer in '54 the microchip in 68, the personal computer in 82, always 14 years because it's young people who invent everything, the internet in 96, the mobile net in 2010, and the truth net this year in 24. This is the beginning of this movement. The movement hadn't even started. We played the national anthem. We just entered the field. Now we get to go have fun. So go, go surf, go enjoy the sunshine. In his concluding remarks, Yusko touches on the enduring value of gold as a traditional asset base which has been the standard for many central banks globally. However, the rapid accumulation of gold by nations like China suggests a strategic positioning for an economic landscape influenced by digital assets. The idea of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies disrupting traditional financial and political structures is gaining traction. As countries experiment with both gold and digital currencies as base layers for their financial systems, we're approaching a potential pivotal shift in global economic power dynamics. The integration of blockchain technology promises a move towards financial transparency and independence, challenging the very fabric of how nation states operate today. This could lead to a future where digital currency is not just an investment asset, but a cornerstone of financial sovereignty. Thank you for watching, and remember to subscribe and like this video for more in depth discussions and expert insights.